Uh, so, Namaskar, Namaste everyone on behalf of Central Secretariat Library with City Book Leaders. I welcome you all for this session with Professor Meera on the life of C. Subramanya Bharti based upon her book, uh, The Coming Age, the one that you can see in my background. Uh, my name is Mohit Gupta and I'll be the session host uh, for this nearly 30 to 35 minutes of conversation with Professor Meera Rajan. Uh, to begin with the session, I would like to quote that I came across Subramanya Bharti uh, at a time when Bharti left the world at similar to that age. Uh, while I am almost 40, uh, that was a time when Subramanya Bharti left this world in 1921. And I felt so ignorant that I had no idea who this Mahakavi Subramanya Bharti is. It's only because of a project that I was working with IGNCA and it was my job to read and study and figure out uh, uh, such legendary freedom fighters and the contributors to our country's independence that I came across C. Subramanya Bharti. And I'm blessed that uh, in the last couple of months, I have been able to go through uh, nothing less than 10 to 12 books around Subramanya Bharti. One definitely uh, is by uh, uh, Dr. Vijay uh, Bharti, uh, uh, Professor Meera's mother. It's a remarkable book and the best is uh, when I received it, it's a typical classic with hard book cover and, and, and it's a paper bound. It's a beautiful book and, and I would like to show my notes that I actually made around this book. It's a, it's a remarkable book which takes you into a lovely journey of uh, uh, C. Subramanya Bharti's life and it also brings in a lot of aspects that are interconnected, intersuned into his life that has made him to be a true Mahatma. Uh, many a times we know that uh, Mahatma is associated with Mahatma Gandhi and of course, to everyone uh, with whom we speak about, whose ideologies, whose philosophies, we always always follow in life. And I believe that's what Bharti has accomplished after almost 100, exactly 100 years while he left uh, us. His inspiration, his writings are still, I must say, they are very much in fashion and in vogue when it comes to inspiring others in masses. And that's what Subramanya Bharti's contribution is. I would like to formally uh, introduce to you uh, C. Subramanya Bharti, who lived uh, 1882 to 1921, was one of the builders of modern India, an early nationalist thinker from South India. Bharti's literary genius ignited a renaissance in the literature of his native language, that is Tamil. Uh, he is known as the Mahakavi, which is uh, the supreme poet of the Tamils. And many at times, quote unquote, we also call him um, Tamil Tagore, which I think is is up to an extent is, uh, is a comparison which uh, is not required somehow. It's possibly our own ignorance and especially people like me who have been always in North India who, who never realized that there is so much treasure in our country that we as countrymen should explore even if we are in the country or outside the country. Uh, he is known to be as a Mahakavi uh, of the Tamils. Bharti can lay the claim to be uh, one of the India's foremost uh, agilitarian writers arguing for the supremacy of women and the irrelevance of caste. Uh, if I have to compare with him, possibly from slightly uh, um, or with any other poet, I think it would be Nazir uh, um, who has actually written poem about everything and that's what Subramanya Bharti has also written poem about um, Jesus, on Allah, on Russia. He has picked up so many subjects that it's amazing to see how a person at that young and ripe age uh, could even uh, pursue such uh, interests. And that's what Subramanya Bharti is to us. The popularity of his songs during the freedom movement long after his death uh, led to the government of India giving the copyrights of his works to the people of India as a gift. And altogether now there are episodes, there are books around uh, the claim of the copyright as well, which itself has uh, uh, been a subject of a biopic possibly. Uh, on behalf of Central Secretary Library, in collaboration with CBL, uh, we are celebrating the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahasar, which is the 75th year. Uh, we are hosting Professor Meera Rajan, a noted author and a great granddaughter of Bharti, who shall share her thoughts from her latest book, uh, C. Subramanya Bharti, The Coming Age, uh, which is a collection of Bharti's writings. That's what she has edited. Formally introducing all of you to Meera, uh, Professor Meera. Professor Amira T. Sundarajan is a writer, a classic pianist, and a scholar and professor who holds a doctorate in law from Oxford University. A Canadian citizen by birth, she is fluent in English and French and has read the both literatures extensively. 
She's the daughter of Bharti scholar S. Vijay Bharti, I just mentioned to you, and a great granddaughter of Mahakavi Bharti. This session is a tribute to the great poet and the patriot on his 100th uh, death anniversary, who breathed his last on 11th September 1921 at a ripe age of 39. And I must say, he lived the life to the fullest uh, that we are remembering him today. And we have so much inspiration to be taken from his life. I now invite uh, Professor Meera Sundararjan to present her thoughts and also to introduce us to the life of Bharati. Thank you so much for those kind words and indeed for your invitation today. I'm absolutely delighted that I could join you for this session and uh, nothing could make me happier than to have the opportunity to speak to all of you about uh, one of my absolute favorite subjects in the world, my great grandfather, C. Subramanian Bharati, and of course, this new book that has just been uh, published of Bharati's writings. And uh, Sri Mohit speaks uh, so well that generally speaking, it's impossible to disagree with him on anything. I only have one point of disagreement in everything that you said, which is you said Bharati left us 100 years ago. So I would respectfully beg to differ and say, no, he's very much present today in many senses, but definitely in the sense this, that his writings are present with us. They are alive and well. His thoughts and ideas continue to be with us and continue to be uh, an inspiration, I think, for anyone who has the good fortune to be able to read them. Lovely. So the title of my short presentation today is Mahakavi C. Subramaniam Bharati, a national bard. And as uh, Sri Mohit mentioned, a very important anniversary is coming up in just a few days, September 11th, 2021. It will be exactly 100 years to the day that Bharatiya passed uh, to, to the other world. And I consider that to be the moment at which his legacy was born. It's a great privilege and also something quite humbling for me that over the past year, and indeed, uh, going back even further, the book for which you're seeing the cover now has been more than a decade in the making, actually. But the past year has been a time of intensive work on it. And I'm very, very privileged and humbled to be able to offer this publication to celebrate the 100 years of Bharatiya's legacy. And it's Penguin Modern Classics that has brought the book out. It is the book of Bharati's original writings in the English language. And Penguin Modern Classics has just done a superlative job with this project. Without their vision, the book simply could not have been published like this or in time for the anniversary. So many, many thanks are due to them. And I'm quite excited to see that beside uh, Mohit Ji, there is a book because I have not yet seen the physical book, <laughs> which is apparently in transit somewhere. Uh, between India and California. So I'm very happy to see the book there on your desk and know that it is available in India. Very, very good. So when uh, Mohit had invited me to have this presentation today, he had proposed a title for the presentation, A National Bard. And I was intrigued by this. And when I went away and thought about it a little bit, I thought, this is an absolutely ingenious title. It's a wonderful title to talk about Subramaniam Bharati. Why? Well, there are two main reasons that struck me right away. First of all, those who speak Tamil call Bharati a Mahakavi. In English, when we speak about the bard, we talk about Shakespeare. And I think that a very nice comparison can be made between Bharati, the Tamil Mahakavi, as the Shakespeare of the Tamils, and of course, the Shakespeare of the English. Why do I say that? Because Bharati's writing accomplished two things that are very similar to what Shakespeare's writing has achieved for the English, much earlier in time, of course. <clears throat> First of all, his writing inspired other writers and helped to create a renaissance in 20th century Tamil literature. And secondly, Bharati's Tamil is of such quality that in a sense, he has recreated the Tamil language for modern speech in a very beautiful way. And so when we speak Tamil today, much of what we use in the language is actually derived from Bharati's writing. So it's a tremendous contribution at the level of the language. 
And so I would say in this sense, he's very much a bard. He is a kind of Shakespeare of the Tamils, given what he has accomplished for the Tamil language and culture. Secondly, this idea of his being a national bard, <clears throat> I think it's so fitting because Bharati was a nationalist, a freedom fighter, but his nationalism was of a particular kind. It was a pan-Indian nationalism. And in fact, it's well worth remembering that India is such a vast place. And during the national struggle, people made enormous contributions and enormous sacrifices from every corner of this vast great land, every culture, every group you can imagine. There was somebody who stepped forward and had the heroism to stand up for Indian nationalism and to resist the British rule. So this is very much the pan-Indian nationalism nationalism of which Bharati was a part and was a leader. And moreover, in his own training, he had the opportunity to live in different parts of India and to absorb the ethos that he experienced in different parts of the country. So in that sense, in his person, he incarnates a pan-Indian ideal. So in the light of those considerations, <clears throat> it seems only appropriate to begin considering Bharati's story with a map of India. <clears throat> and if we want to see where Bharati's point of origin was, we have to look in the far south of the country, the far southeast, we can see Tamil Nadu state. Now, if we take a closer look at Tamil Nadu, you see a number of districts here, we have to keep looking towards the south. <clears throat> so if we go deep into the south, we can see Tirunelveli district and Thutukudi district. And these two districts are the area where Bharati traces his origin. In fact, he came from the town of Eteyapuram and his wife came from the Tirunelveli district from the village of Kadayam. So let's take a still closer look. And just here we can see towards the top of this map, the town of Eteyapuram, which was Bharati's place of birth. And in fact, this is the house where Subramanian Bharati was born in Antiyapuram. It's now a museum. And the interesting thing about Antiyapuram is it was a town that had a Maharaja in those days. And Bharati grew up in the environment of the Maharaja's court, the Samastanam of the Maharaja. His father was one of the people associated with the court and he used to take Bharati as a small boy to the court. And there was a group of people there who were Tamil scholars and Tamil writers who got to know the little boy. The little boy was very precocious. And in fact, he impressed the community of scholars so much with his poetical skills while he was just a child, truly a prodigy, that they gave him the name Bharati when he was seven years old. So he had already showed his excellence in poetry at the age of seven, and this was recognized by the scholars of the court. So Bharati is not uh, Subramanian Bharati's given name, that is a title that was acquired by him as a seven-year-old boy, given to him by the scholars of the court of the Maharaja of Edyapuram. And here's a picture of the Maharaja, just to help to bring that period to life. So after Bharati's father passed away, he was a teenager, feeling quite aimless in his life in many ways. And he had a wonderful opportunity at that time to go and stay with some relatives in Varanasi, where he pursued his studies. And when he got there, he was absolutely intoxicated with the atmosphere of the city, the deep learning of the traditional culture, the languages, the study of Sanskrit and Hindi. He embraced all of that with typical characteristic youthful enthusiasm, which never left him, by the way. And he became so absorbed into the life there that he also adopted at that time his manner of dress. So this is when he started wearing the turban and the jacket and presenting himself essentially in North Indian style, I would venture to say. And that is the image of Subramanya Bharatiya that has become iconic. So when Bharati became involved in the national movement, he began traveling to the various Congress meetings and participating in the various national activities. When he went to uh, the meeting in Surat, 
he then came back towards the south of India. And at that time, he had the chance to meet another important figure in the national movement, Sister Nivedita. Sister Nivedita, as many of you will know, was an Irish woman who became a great devotee and disciple of Swami Vivekananda. And in fact, her main role when she came to India was to lead initiatives related to women's education, about which she was very, very passionate. And indeed, Swami Vivekananda himself, of course, was very passionate. And Swami Vivekananda says about her, what was wanted was not a man, but a woman, a real lioness to work for the Indians, women especially. So when uh, Bharati was traveling uh, on his way between the Surat Congress and the South, he met Sister Nivedita and actually had a vision of what the place of women should be in society that inspired him brief, that inspired him very deeply. And then he went on to dedicate the first volume of his national songs to Sister Nivedita, saying that she was his guru and that from her, he had learned the meaning of service to the nation. Quite a remarkable fate for an Irish woman to find in India as well. And here then is a picture of Bharati as he matured with his wife Chalama. And to me, this is a tremendously moving picture because my understanding is that in those days, husband and wife didn't usually take pictures like this. A typical picture would involve the men of the family seated, the women standing behind them. Bharati said, no, my wife is my life partner. She is my equal. She is my companion in the national struggle. She is standing beside me and she and I are a unit. And that is how we're going to be photographed together. So he not only espoused the values of feminism, but he lived those values in his everyday life as well. Eventually his activities against the British, in particular his writing in favor of the freedom movement became very troublesome to the administration in Madras province. And his writings ended up being proscribed and a great deal of pressure built about his presence in South India until finally he decided that he had to leave British territory. And so he fled with his family to Pondicherry, where he joined the community of exiles, national, nationalist exiles, who had left British India and went to live under the French administration, as it then was in Pondicherry. And this is a picture of the house where he lived there, which has now been made a museum as well. And uh, a great deal of renovation has been done to this house. It's, this is actually not how it looked the last time that I visited it, but there is a wonderful collection there of many materials about Bharati, his life and writings. In fact, he spent 11 years in Pondicherry and during that time he wrote many of his literary masterpieces, many of his major poems, as well as remaining involved to the greatest extent that he could in journalistic writing and in pro-nationalist writing in various newspapers and so on. And one of the things that he describes in the book that has just been published is actually what it was like to live in that situation. So how the nationalist exiles were treated in Pondicherry, how their presence was tolerated by the French administration, but there was some understanding between the French and the British all the same. And these uh, people who were fighting for India had to endure quite a bit of harassment by the British police. They would make forays into Pondicherry, try to capture these people and take them back to face courts and jail and various punishments uh, under the British administration. So it was a very tense situation and um, Bharati and his family were living like the other exiles very much on the edge, uh, although they had fled to the French territory of Pondicherry. This then is a photograph of Bharati's family as it became more extended and as well as his disciples, the two young men standing in the back. So we see Bharati, we see Chalama, his wife, who is seated beside him. And then on the side of the screen, two young women that you see there, the young woman and the young girl are Bharati's daughters. So the lady who is standing, Tangamar Bharati, was his elder daughter. She was my grandmother. And then the young girl who is seated, Shagdala Bharati, she is the younger daughter of Bharati. And 
I wanted to show you this photograph, which was taken not very long before Bharati's death, because when he passed away, his legacy was left in the hands of these three women, two young women and a young girl. And they have done an enormous amount, especially Chalama and her legacy was then carried on by Tangama and to an extent Shakuntala. They have done an enormous amount to preserve Bharati's works and to facilitate their dissemination in the period following his death. Their contribution really is immeasurable, particularly the contribution of Chalama, and that deserves to be recognized. I can say one more interesting thing there because we're talking about the biography of Bharati right now. Chalama Bharati actually became his first biographer. So she wrote a book called Bharati Sharitra. Now, in those days, women typically did not get a very high level of education. And sure enough, Chalama's ability to read and write was limited. Almost all the education she received was from her husband through the study of her husband's poetry. And in fact, she has such a remarkable mind and devotion to that poetry that she more or less memorized everything that he had written. And ultimately, when she wanted to write about her husband's life, she dictated his biography to Tangamar, who actually was the scribe for that book. And thereby she became the first biographer of her husband. Here is um, a slightly longer term picture. So in this photograph, we see both Bharati's children and his grandchildren. So in the middle, that is Chalama, who then became a widow in those days when Bharati passed away and uh, did not on that account acquire any discouragement or lose any confidence in her devotion to the mission of promoting Bharati's works, disseminating Bharati's works that carried her throughout her life. And um, on this, I think it would be the screen left then, you can see Tangamar Bharati, the elder daughter, and then Tangamar's daughter, Lalita, is there. On the screen right, Shakuntala, the younger daughter of Bharati, and uh, one more granddaughter there. And then sitting in front, the children, the young girl on the far right of the screen is actually Vijaya Bharati, my mother, and the author of the book that uh, Sri Mohit described so beautifully. And in fact, Vijaya Bharati's contribution is worth an extra mention because she grew up to become the first person to undertake a critical study of Bharati's works. So, so she was the first scholar to study his works formally in an academic setting. And she did that at Anamala University in Chidambaram. And that book that Mohit was actually telling you about is a slightly reworked English translation of her thesis, her PhD thesis on Bharati art, which inaugurated the field of Bharati criticism. So today we are in a fortunate position to be celebrating the 100th uh, anniversary of Bharati art's legacy. What exactly does that legacy involve? Well, I think some of the key elements are listed here. The idea of national dignity, of course, is key. And there he was speaking about the dignity of India, which must be recognized as against the British rulers of the time. But he also had a much broader vision in that regard. He said, all nations must appear as equals on the world stage. People of all nations must respect each other as equals, including Indians. So that was a very strong notion of national dignity and cultural dignity that he had. Women's rights, very much the center of his legacy, as I illustrated in those photographs that I was able to show you. He was a great champion and pioneer of women's rights. And I think that to this day, not only would we be able to say that he is one of the leading Indians who championed women's rights, but that around the world, he must be one of the leading thinkers on women's social role. And he was such a visionary, he saw so far ahead in time that we as a society have certainly moved towards Bharatiya's ideals of women's equality, but we still have a long way to go to achieve the society that Bharati had in mind. Similarly, with caste equality, Bharati's pioneering work there must be recognized. He was standing right beside Mahatma Gandhi in terms of his incredibly deep commitment to caste equality. And many stories can be told to illustrate that, as well as looking in his works, in his written works, of course. 
And again, it was not only caste equality at the Indian level, but equality in every sense around the world between races, genders, ages. There should be no reason for having any discrimination against any human being, any human individual. And he stood absolutely firmly by that principle and lived by it. In fact, I think this expression, which is ubiquitous in many ways, unity and diversity, should be invoked in describing Bharati because it is such a perfect description of how he saw the world and how he saw reality. And I think in that sense, he was a deeply influenced by Advaita philosophy and himself was a great modern exponent of Advaita, which of course teaches the unity of all creation. And that was the foundational belief driving everything that Bharati thought and wrote and carrying him throughout his life from which he never deviated. So in terms of the Indian struggle, I'm just quoting from one of his poems here. He said, Yellarum yennaattumakkal. Everyone, all Indians are my people. They are the people of my country. Yellarum yennaattumakkal. What is exciting about the book that has just been published is that we see Bharati's writing in the English language and at the same time, his interests are so diverse and his writing was so active, he was so readily engaged in writing in English as well as in Tamil, that his personality emerges through these English writings just as much as we might see it, just as truly as we might see it by reading his Tamil writings. There's no doubt about it. The Bharati that we see then is a pan-Indian figure. He is a multilingual person and a lover of languages and of poetry. One of his pen names was actually Shelley Dawson in homage to the great English romantic poet Shelley. He admired the West Wind Ode to the West Wind of Shelley. He was a multifaceted personality, as I've tried to highlight here, involved in all of these different aspects of Indian life and society, and indeed in life, society, and events all around the world. He was a universalist, again, seeing himself as an Indian on the world stage. One of the essays in the book is actually called India and the World. So he felt that he was representing Indian culture and that Indian culture was one of the great gems of human civilization that must meet all other cultures on terms of equality and indeed on terms of generosity. He said India has a lot to give to the world. Indian culture has untold riches to share with the world and the world must receive that gift. And then, as I mentioned, he was fascinated by Advaita, and I called him a modern exponent of Advaita. That passion also runs very deep because he was engaged in promoting the national struggle and in helping to build modern India. But he was also engaged in building himself as a man of the future. So in a sense, this project of construction, of creation, of building affected everything that he looked at. It was at the individual level, it was at the social level, and it was the national level and international level. Freedom and positive energy must occur at all of these levels for human society to be fully evolved and for human beings to be fully developed and to have opportunities to develop fully. So I'll just conclude with, uh, with one further remark, actually going back to something interesting that Sri Mohit said at the beginning, you spoke about Bharati as possibly the Tagore of the Tamils. And actually, I like this expression very much. One reason being that Bharati himself admired Tagore so much. And one of the pieces that is in this book is actually a piece of journalism that Bharati wrote upon Tagore's travel to Japan. So one of the dreams that Bharatiya had was that he would be able to travel around the world. He wanted to see other countries and cultures, speak to people. And unfortunately, that dream never became a reality. Um, for example, in my case, I have traveled all over the world, including to Japan. And I often think to myself that it's because of my great grandfather's blessings that I could travel like that, because he had that dream. So we, his descendants, at least are able to realize that. But he writes about Tagore's travel to Japan and he says, you know, he, he was astonished by all the honors that were shown to Tagore. And he says, this is a tremendous thing for India because Tagore has gone there representing us, representing our country and culture. And look how the Japanese are recognizing us and meeting us on terms of respect and in fact homage. 
So it's absolutely appropriate, uh, as Mohiji suggested, to refer to Bharati as the Tagore of the Tamils. And I think he would be very proud uh, to be referred to as such. And his, his contributions are very comparable in many ways. In fact, frankly, I think all of the great poets of the world, when we talk about poets of such stature, they belong to a, a family in themselves as well. So uh, we are his family in one sense, the community of poets of the world, they are a family in another sense. So thank you very much for bringing up that comparison. And I hope that my comments here have given you some idea, among other things, of the contents of the book and of the wonderful personality and insights of the poet that may be found therein. This opportunity to know him occurs through the English language. So everyone who speaks English now can read Bharati. And by doing so, there's a tremendous enrichment to be gained because Bharati was such a true exponent of Indian culture and such a deep student of Indian culture through many of her linguistic and cultural traditions. So I would urge everyone to read Bharati, know India and her culture through Bharati, and know poetry, know life. Bharati are said, he whose poetry is his life and whose life is his poetry, that person is a true poet. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Wow. I must say this is uh, one of the most profound presentations on Bharati, and I think you're truly blessed, Professor Meera, uh, and uh, it seems he has uh, himself endowed you as well as your mother with uh, all these uh, expressions, uh, not only in terms of your um, literary adventures, but also um, I know that you also pursue music to a great extent. And uh, it would be an important mention to tell you that today uh, we have few people from Tamil Sangam, from Delhi Tamil Sangam. We have uh, Dr. Srinivas who's coming from Madurai, a very renowned uh, um, scholar. Uh, we have uh, Lakshmi Ayarji, uh, we have Hamsini Murthy, who's, uh, who's somehow related to Bharti. And in fact, she introduced me to uh, one of the close relatives in India as well. And what you have just um, said about Bharti takes us into a deeper thinking. And we should now actually ponder more about uh, the legendary work that he has done. And it's a responsibility of, um, as part of our culture, that how those thoughts reshaped India during those times, especially while he was in Pondicherry and he got inspired by Sri Aurobindo. In fact, everyone he met he, during the same time while Tagore was in Chennai, that was the same time he was also there doing the same work. It's just that they couldn't meet and uh, the exchange of the ideas could not happen. Certainly, he met Ms. Mahatma Gandhiji. And he, he has been influenced by everything good that was there in others. And that's what happens. When someone, and, and, and I think your mother has written in the book that uh, when ego is gone, uh, the prose becomes poetry. And uh, that's what uh, Subramanya Bharti represents in our lives. And many a times the pursuit of poetry as, as a genre, I think it's, it's a very important thing to do. I have some quick questions. And, and before we take questions from uh, our esteemed audience as well, my first question to you would be, uh, while we are talking about him after 100 years, he's still here. And as I mentioned, Mahatma, what do you think is, is uh, uh, what are those uniqueness uh, uh, or unique views uh, that are still relevant today? Of course, you mentioned about women equality, secularism, the way he spoke. So either we have not changed or is it the power of vision that he observed in the forthcoming? And that too, it's so relevant even today, even after 75 years of independence. What's your view on that, Professor Bhati? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I think it is his power of vision. And this to me is what sets apart a poet and a visionary poet of this kind, because he, he looks forward in time in a way that, that is unusual. And he's able to visualize things that seem impossible to those who are alive in the present day. Even something as simple as the freedom from British rule. Well, it's simple now in hindsight. 
you know, but but to take ourselves back to what the situation was more than 100 years ago, you know, the British Empire was the most powerful entity that had ever existed in the world, in human history. And yet for him, it was a matter of course that they would be gone from India and that India would get self-rule. And it was at the peak of the empire while he was writing that. And I think it's it's actually quite mistaken to, to say that, well, you know, these were imaginative people and they they tried to see you know, they tried to see forward, they tried to be optimistic. I think it's actually something much deeper than that, you know, that they had visionary experiences that actually helped them to visualize these things happening. So I think with that kind of vision about everything that he touched, really, you know, his writing continues to be relevant. I mean, I can't even express how relevant it is. If you pick up that book and flip to anything there, you may as well think that it was written today or yesterday or maybe tomorrow. Um, which is not to say, you know, I think we have changed as a society, but we have not gone the full distance of what he envisioned, because his characteristic was clarity of mind, arrivile terrible, you know, and he he saw propositions through to their logical endpoints. So equality of women didn't mean that women could work, but then they would come home and cook and they would be in, in uh, charge of cleaning up the house and so on. No, equality of women meant the whole way. Men and women, they share everything equally. You know, so this was typical of his thinking. He had that kind of clarity and that kind of uh, commitment to logic, if I can even put it that way, in his thinking. So we as a society have definitely progressed. And part of the reason we've progressed is because we have the great light provided by writing like this to help us to progress. But we still have a long way to go before we actually catch up to what he wrote about 100 years ago. So we need to keep moving forward. So actually, that's that's a very fantastic way of looking at it. And I must admit, uh, I'll be slightly selfish here when I will represent Mr. Rao from Central uh, Secretariat Library, um, Rakesh Ji, Bish Ji, and all my colleagues from Central Secretariat Library. That possibly because he started reading at a very early age. He was always very fond of reading. And I think that's what gives you a complete 360 degree view. And a book actually makes you travel the whole world, I guess. And Bharti was fortunate enough to, to delve into the habit of reading. And I can say it because we represent a very reading focused organization. Uh, so that could be one of the views. There's a very interesting aspect that has just come as a question or I must say as an observation from Amudhanji. I don't know from where has uh, he or she has logged in, but that's about the translation bit of it. Um, while he's saying that on um, Tagore's Gitanjali, Keats, and, and uh, there's a lot of um, great uh, translation has been done. Um, it's his personal view, while I may disagree to his view that uh, the other translation that has been done on Bharti's works are, are slightly... Um, lacking in terms of the actual uh, flow of uh, the poet's views. But I think we still, as it's always said, the translation actually somewhere it doesn't give you that opportunity to, to bring that same flow that the poet really wanted to do. I guess that's one observation that has just come in. But he's still asking, um, is there a possibility that we see that great translation coming in? This is typically absolutely personal. Believe me, I'm just passing on the comments to you. And, but I still see there is equal opportunity and there's more to come for that aspect. Yeah, I, if I may add a couple of comments there, I think that's actually an incredibly important question that's come in. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the situation with Bharati translation is actually, you know, frankly, quite dreadful. Not only are there not adequate translations, but there are many translations that are circulating which totally misrepresent the works of the poet and the quality and so on. So the lack of translation is undoubtedly a problem. The lack of quality translation is undoubtedly a problem. How far can translation go in bringing the quality of the original language? That's just a question to which no one knows the answer. But what I can say for sure is I don't think the attempt to do the best possible translation has yet happened. And within this particular book, so let me just be absolutely clear that the book that has just been published is Bharati's original writing in English. So generally speaking, they're not translations, they're works that he wrote in English to begin with. But there are a few translations that he has made of his own poems, and also of some classics from Tamil literature, from Nachiar and so on. If you read those translations from the Tamil classics, 
tears will be coming down your face. He has done such beautiful translations from classical Tamil into English. And so I'm, I'm very hesitant to say you cannot do moving and important translation because he has done some himself. So I think this is just a field where a certain momentum has to build up and maybe the dialogue between the cultures, you know, English and, and Tamil and Indian culture needs to be more prolonged in the future so that they can come to understand each other better and find some common ground. And that ultimately is what is going to build a better quality of translation. Um, and let me make a final comment also that I, I think as well that by reading translation, hopefully those who read the translations will get inspired to go and look at the original Tamil. You know, to my mind, the best translations are the ones where you have the original language on one yes. page and then the yes. translation on the other. And so you can actually have the two texts living before you and experience, it, experience them both. I have used books like that myself in my study of language. And so I, I would like to think that that is the future. So Tamil should be reinvigorated through the act of translation and should gain a broader community in the future. Mahakavi Bharati loved the Tamil language, and I think that he would like to be part of the process of that happening for sure. And I must vouch for it, uh, Professor Meera. Um, we have been uh, studying Sanskrit for some time now. We have a very noted Acharya, which is more a Sanskrit appreciation that we do. So much so that after getting introduced to Bharati's work, my appreciation for the language has actually gone up. And I, being a chaste North Indian, I would love to delve into this language not only Tamil, but other languages as well. And I think as part of our growing up, this learning should not go out as, as the countryman. And uh, I'm taking the liberty on, on behalf of all people who have come from Ministry of Culture. I think that's their impeccable job that they are doing for this country, especially the Central Secretariat Library, which being a, uh, a hub of um, the collection of all the great books as well as articles. And I think they can play a great role in the, on this. I'm very intrigued to know about Tamil for sure. So yeah, that's wonderful, to, that's wonderful to hear. Sorry, I, I was just going to add one more comment because I don't think that Indians should at all blame themselves or blame ourselves in any way for not taking an interest or not being able to learn regional languages because I think, frankly, that the British had a very active policy of trying to damp down those languages. And it's something that Bharati talks about in such an eye-opening yes. way in a couple of very short very pithy and powerful pieces. You know, yes. those, are, those are gems that you can understand so much through reading those couple of pieces in the book. In fact, the letter and he wrote to Hindu, the Hindu, the, the letter yes. that he has included in this, it's a very powerful letter. Absolutely. And so, you know, what he's discussing there is the policy of the British to replace regional languages by English, but then not only the fact of replacing, but the spirit in which it was done. You know, they called uh, Tamil a vernacular language. And Bharati hated that term so much that he can't even write the word. He has to put it in quotations every time yes. that he uses it. And in, finally, he asks, he says, well, why is the vernacular Tamil anything less than the vernaculars of your countries, English and German? Our language is more ancient. We have works of a certain stature. Show me those comparable works in English, in German, in your languages and tell me how they are better than ours before you call our language a vernacular. So it is about the closest. Bharati is never, ever a chauvinist. It's, he's simply incapable of that perspective. It would be contemptible to him. That is the closest that he ever comes, though, you know, sure. where he says, where he stands up for the language and says, I refuse to consider the Tamil language a vernacular, and the Europeans should not be referring to it as such. <laughs> True. Uh, I think I'll just go del I I'll go slightly deeper into the philosophy of the work that uh, C. Subramanian Bharti has done. Uh, what do you think are the best form of uh, forms of philosophy and spiritual practice, especially the one which is Uchi Medu Vani Dishindu, No Fear, No Fear, No Fear, that poem. In fact, I, I, I keep reading to the translation of that poem, but I'm trying to recite uh, uh, in Tamil as well. I'll try my level best though. But uh, what about that philosophical aspect towards looking everything at life in a very unique way? Absolutely. So the poem, I think, is Acha Minlai, Acha Minlai, Acha Men Badilai. Acha is fear, Ilai, there is no. So th there is no fear, there is no fear, there is no such thing as fear. Fear itself doesn't exist. And um, absolutely, again, this is a, a wonderful question to ask. <clears throat> you know, as I was uh, describing a few moments ago, 
the one of the interesting things about Bharati is the way he saw the freedom struggle occurring at multiple levels. And one of those levels was in terms of the psychological or mental freedom within the individual. And I think that that was an incredible insight on his part, you know, because for him, the colonialism was not only the imposition of institutions on India, but it was the mentality, the feeling of dispossession and inferiority that it creates within the mind of the individual. And in fact, in that sense, all of his poetry, everything that he wrote, I think, was on a mission to give individuals a sense of self-esteem and dignity at a time when they were really downtrodden because of the British presence, the form that it took on, on Indian soil. So we can find a lot of his writings, in short, in answer to your question, where he talks in very, very personal terms about how to approach dealing with oneself, one's attitude to life, finding courage, and so on. Even in what he writes in English, it's so fascinating that he wrote a journal in English, which is kind of a, he's written it in many forms at once. It's almost a combination or a pastiche of poetry as well as prose, his journal of thoughts, where he actually describes in detail his own undertakings to try to purify himself psychologically and to develop these positive values, the, the, the fire of his good character within himself. So by reading a work like that, you know, it's very moving, first of all, that a person of such stature went through such hard work on himself. But secondly, he's done something very generous because he's charted a path that any reader can also follow, going through a lot of the same methodologies that he describes and so on. And I would be negligent if I didn't mention that, you know, when he went to Banaras, one of the important things he, he acquired there was his knowledge of Sanskrit. In fact, he's written a beautiful poem on, on Sanskrit, and Bula Kumari as well. Um, but uh, he, he had a love for Sanskrit, and he then got involved in studying Sanskrit literature, the Vedas and so on, with Sri Aurobindo sure. in the time that they spent together in Pondicherry. That was essentially the core of their friendship, is they would read this Vedic literature together. And I understand that I'm not a Sanskrit scholar myself, but from reading him, I understand that the form of Sanskrit that, that is taken in those texts is very particular and requires a very deep study in order to understand the meaning. So he undertook all of that. And that influenced his development enormously. Also, um, Patanjali Yoga Sutra was a work that he had studied extensively, he had translated Bhagavad Gita. So he had a real solid foundation in Sanskrit literature, religious and philosophical literature at the time. But what he did, being a poet of such stature and a Renaissance thinker, is he brought those works and that knowledge into everything that he wrote in any language, I would say, Tamil, Sanskrit, or English. And so we can have that window of opportunity onto seeing what he knew and essentially being able to acquire that knowledge through him whenever we read his writing, including the English works that are in this book. Sure. And I think I would like to also men mention to everyone who may, know, may not know, but uh, just after the, the tragedy of Bhopal gas that happened uh, way back in 1980s, um, the f many of the Protestants actually used some of the verses by, by Subramanya Bharti. Mm. Now imagine actually it happened almost 60 years after, um, after Bharti's death. And also very recently in one of the addresses, uh, our Honorable Prime Minister actually recited the entire poem, and uh, which, is, which is a great honor to not only to the language, but to the thoughts of the poet, and uh, which represents. And there's a beautiful chapter in, in your book as well, which is about uh, um, languages as uh, uh, the media of instruction, the national languages as the media of instruction. I would quickly like you to tell something about uh, how can language and the, the culmination of the great thoughts can lead to something very good for the nation, as well as while we talk about Vasudev Kutumbakam, not only for us as a country, but for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to, we have to face a difficult reality. I think that English has achieved a global dominance. And it's... Uh, I mean, I guess it's something that has both positive and negative aspects from an Indian point of view. Very often people say that the current prosperity and success enjoyed by India on the world stage is because 
uh, among other things, there is a presence of English that allows the country to function in a very advanced way. And I don't think we would be doing ourselves any favors by denying the power of English. But <clears throat> as I said, you know, for Bharati, cultural diversity was very important. And the Tamil language was very important, but he saw other languages as being important in their own right as well. So I think that what he would like to see is exactly this process that although we may be living in an English dominated environment, we start to have an awareness of the importance of our tradition and go back and explore and learn whatever we can about it. Um, so all I can say is it's a, it's a very difficult situation. You know, we have to acknowledge the state of the world that we live in, but I think it's equally true that if we don't take some action, you know, the end result is not going to be good. And I don't think any language in the world can actually stand its ground against the onslaught of English in that sense. Um, by the way, I don't necessarily think the English language is benefiting from its own widespread dissemination either. I mean, that's another, that's another discussion. But, um, you know, we have to take some responsibility and try to do what we can uh, to the extent that we can learn languages or get exposure to the literatures, to the ways of thinking through translation, do the best we can to take an interest. You know, every word that we learn, I, I sometimes think to myself, because my mother tongue is not Tamil, except in the sense that my mother spoke Tamil. You know, I was born in an English speaking country, but I studied Tamil. I spoke Tamil with my parents, with my mother in particular. And I, I always think to myself, I know the Tamil word Amma, and I can therefore identify myself as a Tamilian. That word means mother. So Amma, also they would refer to the nation as Mada Parashakti and Bharat Mata, the mother. So I think we have to do what we can, you know, even if it means learning one word, if it means reading and translation, if it means teaching, yes. er encouraging people that we meet to learn the languages. But action must be taken if we want to preserve the cultural diversity, the richness of, of India's cultural diversity, which I think is unparalleled. It, it must be taken. True. That's, uh, that's definitely very true. And uh, I guess I will again take the liberty of representing Central Secretary Library as well as the Ministry of Culture, which is actually doing um, a lot of such initiatives uh, to make this happen, to bring this diversity um, through uh, this unity through diversity. But I would also like to um, convey my personal thanks to Sri Partha Sarthiji, who couldn't join because of some meeting that's happening you now. Who's the regional secretary Ministry of Culture, Sri Manoj Dehuriji, because of some personal reason, Manojji also could not join. Me. But we have the privilege of having Sri Mr. Y. Ramiji and the entire team of CSL and CBL. Um, I would also yet again give a mention to um, um, Mr. Viranganathan, uh, a former IPS, uh, representing Tamil Sangam um, uh, and everyone who could tune in today. But uh, I will now request Sri M.C. Besji, who is the Library Information Officer at the Central Secretariat Library, to convey his word of thanks uh, in pose that I may be able to recite of the poem that we were just talking. Maheshi, please. On behalf of Central Secretariat Library and City Book Leader, we are thankful to our uh, today's guest, Professor Meera T. Sundar Rajanji, a noted author and the granddaughter of great Tamil Mahakavi, Sri C. Subramanya Bharati Ji, known as one of the uh, builders of the modern India and early nationalist thinker from South India. There is no doubt that she has described the interesting pen pictures about Sri Subramanya Bharati Ji in details. As all of you are aware that our country is celebrating Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav our today's joint program with City Book Leader is also a part of the SAD series. Mm -hmm. I am very thankful to our additional secretary, Sri Partha Sarthi, Sen Sarmaji, and our director, Sri Manoj Dehuriji, for providing their valuable guidance and uh, motivations time to time. I also endorse the operation of Sri Mohit Gupta Ji. Uh, city book leader and the cooperation of my staff under the leadership of mainly Dr. Y.A. Rao, LIO, 
श्री राकेश गोस्वामी जी श्री मुनीर सेन जी श्री नीरज कुमार जी श्री अजय भास्कर जी ऑल आर एल आईओ एंड श्री देव कुमार एंड श्री अंकित आचार्या जी लाइब्रेरी प्रोफेशनल आई एम ऑल्सो थैंकफुल टू अवर मेंबर्स लीडर्स हु हैव पार्टिसिपेटेड इन द टुडेज प्रोग्राम थैंक्स टू एवरीबॉडी अगेन थैंक यू वेरी मच thank you very much mahesh ji uh, and uh, we getting some very beautiful uh, comments professor meera um, i would now open the chat to everyone so that they can send direct messages to each and every one that is one we just received a message from jafna uh, there is a student who has mentioned about multiple verses and believe me in these 60 minutes like an old t series cassette or a tdk cassette you know we have limitations of the time with us at 60 minutes but we would love to have uh, a complete set of our lives dedicated to bharati and i think what bharati has given me in the last couple of minute, months when i have been reading about him especially is that feeling of no fear and and with this pandemic going on with so much happening around businesses we are all always in in a, in, a, in a format of anxiety and i think uh, that's where one of uh, my very close uh, friends and mentors uh, is a ceo of a very large oil and gas company and when i said that sir i'm reading about bharati is like a book friend to me he actually uh, said in our school days whenever you we used to fear exams we only used to recite this poem uh, i i am not able to recite it in the in the tamil but somehow i got a beautiful translation of it uh, by a very noted north indian poet who based it was based out of bareilly and he has translated it into uh, hindi and possibly while we were talking about the translation and the quality of translation i can still sense and say that it's about the expressions that uh, uh, the words bring to us and the feelings that are hidden in that poem um, the translation actually goes like this and professor meera if you would like to add to it you can add the tamil version of it but i will quickly say a few lines of this poem which is nirbhay 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 chahe puri duniya hamare viruddh ho jaye nirbhay 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 चाहे हमें अपशब्द कहे कोई चाहे हमें ठुकराए निर्भय 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 चाहे हमसे छीन ली जाए जीवन की सुविधाएं विच इज वेरी रिलेवेंट टू पेंडेमिक चाहे हमसे छीन ली जाए जीवन की सुविधाएं निर्भय 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 चाहे हमें संगीत साथी ही विष देने लग जाए निर्भय 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 चाहे सर पर आसमान ही क्यों ना फटने लग जाए निर्भय 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 that's the hindi translation of the poem that uh, professor meera was mentioning a while ago and professor meera if you would like to add to the tamil part of it we would be happy to listen to that as your closing remarks well i i think the essence of it was uh, what i quoted before which you can also match to the translation which is simply achamilai 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 and uh, i i can i don't speak hindi myself i'm so embarrassed to say my father was a great hindi scholar and actually got a prize for hindi debating from nehru himself yeah <laughs> uh, who said that he could not believe that a south indian could learn hindi to such a level <laughs> and so here i am and i have not uh, yet <laughs> learned hindi but i could feel how beautiful the translation must be from the way in which you recited it and uh, i i thank you very much for that it's a beautiful thing to see translation between <laughs> the indian languages I will I will take the liberty here uh, Professor Meera to formally introduce you to Veer Ranganathan ji from Tamil Sangam I have opened his mic as well and he recited the poem to me a day ago uh, sir uh, why don't you uh, uh, give us the pleasure of closing the session with uh, the recitation of the poem please by the way Mr Ranganathan is a former uh, IPS he was uh, uh, part of the Delhi police a very senior cop and you can see his uh, other side as as uh, a literature lover and as a culture lover Prof, uh, mr ranganathan sabal uh, vanakkam we are uh, i am very much delighted to hear the lecture of uh, ms meera sundar rajan actually again and again one question is being asked by our youngsters whether poems of bharati is relevant today also so the answer is by expressing his dreams he has set goals for us so it is still relevant and even though we have achieved to some extent in the field of emancipation of women and in other uh, uh, activities also but still we have a long way to go so delhi tamil sangam 
he is always doing a lot of work in propagating the bharati's dreams as well as the goals he is set for so i conclude my uh, just participation with achamillai achamillai acham enbadillaye uchi meegu vaadinindi veeninda ponilum achamillai achamillai acham enbadillaye thank you no fear no fear and thank you professor meera for bringing the uh, uh, bharati yet again to us in a new form and i would recommend this book before it also reaches you to everyone to have this book um this is this is there's a list of other books as well usha rajgopalan's uh, the translation she has done remarkable work that she has done m raja ram's uh, book which is i sing the glory of this land and also if you wish to take this story to children amar chitra katha has done a beautiful uh, illustrative uh, book on uh, bharati and uh, but if you are uh, slightly more aware this book and uh, dr vijay bharati's books will take you deep into the life of uh, bharati i would recommend this book to everyone and with this we are very very thankful uh, prof professor rajan that you could join in and that to so late uh, in your time zone uh, thanks a lot for all the efforts and on behalf of cbl city uh, city book leaders as well as central secretariat library we would like to convey our word of thanks to you and many many gratitude professor rajan thank you very much